I was brought up in a world where it was just 20 grams of of protein is justified. That's all we needed, 20 grams. That's, you know, and that's what a, a protein scoop is. Mm. But now, and I think um, I think this rise came from a, a recent study, maybe in the last year from Brad Schoenfeld, where he actually said that there's no upper limit. Did he say he, he, he published an article about there's no upper limit on how much protein you can have at one point. So I want to go into now your sure, second sure. point about yes. distribution. Distribution, yeah, yeah. So that is something I'm going to, I'm going to do my best not to complicate this. So Brad and I, we wrote a paper on what is, how much protein in a single meal can be used for building muscle. Mm. So that's similar to the title of our paper, our, uh, how much muscle in a single meal can be used to build muscle, something like that. I never remember the, the complicated and cantankerous titles of my papers. Yeah. <laughs> but this was a paper co-authored by Brad and I, and we looked at the existing literature, and we looked at, and a, a lot of this um, stuff is based in, in Moore and colleagues' work on acute muscle protein synthesis effects of various doses of protein. And it turns out that protein muscle protein synthesis maxes out at somewhere right around 0.4 grams per kilogram of body weight. Now this is a per, on a per meal basis. Mm -hmm. So it's right around 0.4 grams per kilogram of body weight. And this is usually for, for younger people. And um, as What's younger people under the age of 50? Mm, college age-ish. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Damn yeah. it. <laughs> you know, let, let me tell you in, in research, there's either college age people yeah. or retirement age people because yeah. folks in their middle age and stuff, they're too busy working and having a life to participate in research studies. So, <laughs> Wow, that's <laughs> that, great. That's what we're limited yeah. to. But um, the range for the protein dose per meal that maximizes muscle protein synthesis is somewhere between 0.4 mm -hmm. to about 0.6 grams per kilogram of body weight. And oh. that's what maximizes muscle protein synthesis. That's the ceiling. And so that translates in absolute terms to about 30 to 50-ish grams to where you hit a ceiling and a plateau in muscle protein synthesis in spite of larger doses for the given meal. Now, this doesn't mean that any protein that you use beyond 30 or that you ingest beyond 30 to 50 grams goes to waste. No, that's not true. It's just that muscle protein synthesis stops rising. But it makes sense anyway because mm. there has to be some sort of rate limiter on growth. Otherwise, we can just eat huge and escalating amounts of protein and look like Phil Heath by the end of the week, right? Mm. And that just doesn't happen. It can't happen. Mm. And so um, while you can utilize, let's say you have all your protein for the day, 100, 10, 120 grams in, in your case, you have it all in one sitting. You'll use the vast majority of it, but you won't necessarily use that for muscle protein synthesis. Okay, so there's a, there's a finite amount per meal that can be used for muscle protein synthesis. So, okay, so with that piece out of the way, um, what we did was we considered the literature on how much total daily protein maximizes muscle growth. So it's somewhere between 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. It's, that's the range that maximizes total daily muscle growth. 0.7 to 1.0 grams per pound for, you know, my my, my American friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so given that the maximal muscle protein synthetic effect occurs somewhere between 0.4 to 0.55 grams per kilogram per meal, then that would require four meals to hit 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight in total for the day. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And so if we were to take this theoretical model of what distribution of protein maximizes muscle growth, it would be roughly four feedings of about 0.4 to point say 0.6 mm. grams per kilogram um, of body weight per day, taken four times over mm -hmm. the course of four meals. And the four meals would be relatively spread throughout 
the entirety of the day rather than yeah. squenching it into a short window. So if somebody's main goal in life was to gain muscle as quickly as possible, mm-hmm. then that's the kind of protocol that they would engage in. Does that mean anything less? Like, let's just say I was having 0.2 grams in a meal. Now, mm, does mm. that, what happens there? Does that mean I just don't stimulate muscle protein synthesis? Does it as mean you just much. go? Yeah, you don't oh, stimulate as, as much. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you look at it like this, like if your goal was to put on muscle as quickly as possible, then you would want to maximize the anabolic response per meal. Mm-hmm. And you would want to maximize the number of times these absolute peaks in, in muscle protein synthesis occur through the course of the day and the course of the week. And so um, that's that's kind of the approach that you would take. Now, this is something that I, I have to mention, and, and this is an important principle. This is theory. Yeah. <laughs> this is theory. Because we don't have the actual longitudinal trials comparing two protein feedings a day versus let's say four protein feedings a day with both of them having an optimized total daily protein. We don't, we don't have that research. Mm. We're just looking at short-term data, what maximizes muscle protein synthesis mm-hmm. within a given distribution of protein intake in the course of a day. And then we're sort of projecting, okay, over the long term, this should maximize muscle growth okay. over the long term. But we're, we're doing we're doing a lot of spec we're doing yes. a lot of speculation and you know w- when you work in the field with clients you work on the best evidence that you've got um, and you try to strike a balance between what's seen in the literature and what's practical to do and frankly I, I think that there's going to be very little measurable difference between somebody who gets their total daily protein intake over the course of three meals versus somebody who does the more optimized you know four. And, and up mm. type of thing. So now yeah. my next question um, is a gender specific question mm-hmm. as a woman. And mm-hmm. um, I would like to know, because look, I think, um, and I don't know if you would agree, I hope you would, that women are females. And by female, I mean assigned female at birth. You were born with ovaries and a uterus. We are underrepresented in academic literature. We mm-hmm. don't have a lot of women that are being studied. So therefore, all of the recommendations that are currently provided to us really fit the male prototype. Yeah. So my question is, is this muscle protein synthesis equation and the amount of protein that you just mentioned fit for females as well across the lifespan? As far as we know, yes. Yes, okay. they, uh, they've compared muscle protein synthesis response in women versus men. Uh, and, okay, admittedly, most of the, the research is on men, maybe two-thirds, yeah, at least. Mm-hmm. But I think we have a large enough uh, body of literature on women to be able to say that uh, their protein needs are very similar mm. to men. Yeah, so, I, I yeah, mean, there hasn't been any any concrete indication that we, we need different different standards and, and uh, however however I, I would grant I would grant that um, since women's lean body mass is significantly lower than men's on a proportional basis and also an absolute basis and so like body fat percent for women is typically you know it, it's it's not uncommon for it to be double the body fat percent of men and so they carry less lean body mass. And so when you assign protein intakes based on total body weight, then there may be a tendency to be slightly over prescribing protein for women. Okay. And what about the aging population for muscle protein synthesis? Does it, does it keep occurring? Like if I have my, my mother and my father, 70 years old, taking this 0.4 grams per kilogram of body weight four times a day, are they going to stimulate it at the same rate as me? Thank you to Apollo Neuro for sponsoring this episode. The Apollo is a therapeutic wearable designed to be worn discreetly on the wrist or ankle that works by sending 
gentle vibrations to the body that signal safety to the brain. It is a safe, non-invasive way to relax, get the sleep you need, focus your attention and find your flow. I have been wearing this certain device for about one year. I originally got it because I really needed to downregulate my nervous system. Yes, As you can tell, I'm very high energy, very high paced. I really wanted a way to hack my system other than meditation, breath work, or even sleep per se. I really wanted to be in the driver's seat. To be honest, guys, I'm not the best meditator, which is why this device works so well. So with this soothing vibrations, Apollo directly engages with my body's nervous system. And these vibrations help to naturally regulate stress responses and promote a state of calm, enhancing my ability to manage daily stresses without reliance on pharmaceutical aids. So if you want to be in the driver's seat, if you meditate and do breath work to calm your nervous system down and you don't want to do that alone because you know that that alone is not as powerful as a device like Apollo, you can grab one of these. You can get $40 off any of the Apollo wearable devices by visiting the link in the description below or simply going to apolloneuro.com and use code neuro40. That is apolloneuro.com with code neuro40 to receive $40 off. As we get older, you know, this is coming from a neurology standpoint, we know that the vessels of the brain just degrade because it's just a natural part of the brain aging process, if you will. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if the, I, I wonder if um, blood vessels play a role in, in muscle protein synthesis. Uh, blood flow definitely does. Okay. Um, as people age now, I'm not sure how much of a sex-based difference there would be in this. And I don't, I don't think there's- No, this would be a, across the board. Yeah, acro- yeah, across the board. A reduced muscle protein synthesis response as we aged, um, then- some of that is due to reduced microvascular perfusion or or blood flow at, at the at the micro level. This mainly occurs from a a lack of training, <laughs> a, a lack of physical activity. Yeah. So physical disuse results in lowered angiogenesis mm-hmm. or creation of the of the the micro and macrovascular tissues. And so when that happens, get decreased blood flow, decreased nutrient delivery, decreased amino acid delivery to target tissues, lower muscle protein synthesis. Oh, so you need, okay. So yeah, that, that makes sense when you break down the protein and it gets delivered via the blood to organs and, and muscles. So Mm -hmm. that would be the, the basis of that. That's Mm -hmm. super interesting. Yeah. 